Good evening. Uh, my name is John Kirby. I'm the Dean of the College of the Environment and Life Sciences. I'd like to welcome you this evening as part of our Diversity Week. And today, the College of the Environment and Life Sciences sponsored a day of activities associated with Diversity Week relating to the world, our, uh, our various populations, and then relating back to Rhode Island, things like sustainable food production, how do we develop sustainable communities, and how do we all work together. Now, um, when I first walked in, all of about six weeks ago to the University of Rhode Island, uh, came from South Dakota, um, I've expressed to the faculty and staff that diversity is our number one priority in the college. Because in order for us to work on the kinds of solutions that we need to have to the world's big problems, like the environment, feeding 9 billion people by 2050, and by producing a world that is still worth living in when your children and grandchildren are here, we have to start now. And we have to work within the structures and the communities of the world in order to make our solutions work for everyone. It's a collaborative project where we don't go tell people what to do, we learn how to work together. Because one of the things we learn is we have cultural identity, we have racial identity, we have religious identity, but there are so many more things that are similar than are different. We have to learn to work together for useful and meaningful solutions. So that sets the general tone for the week as I perceive it in the, the College of the Environment, Life Sciences and our role in the university. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our provost, Dr. DeHayes, who comes from a long experience in working and in increasing our awareness of diversity issues and cultural identity from the University of Vermont, who's been here for two and a half years now as provost, Dr. Hayes. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and welcome, everyone, to the 2010 Lifespan keynote lecture as part of Diversity Week. I want to take a moment to, to acknowledge and thank our partners at Lifespan who year in and year out for the last four years have stepped up and helped you or I, not only with Diversity Week, but with other diversity programs around the campus. I think that's not only an important message about Lifespan's values, but uh, it really tells and reinforces what Dr. Kirby just said about the broad scale importance of diversity issues to a viable and a healthy population of people throughout Rhode Island, the country, and the world. So. Uh, so, so thank you to Lifespan. It's very, very important that they're our partners, and they're in part, our partners in, in, in health research as well, and uh, in, in the, the training of healthcare professionals in the future. Given the, the Lifespan sponsorship, it's particularly appropriate that our speaker tonight is not only a researcher, but also an attending physician. And we're very, very pleased to have Dr. Esteban Gonzalez Burchard here from the University of California and San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez Burchard is the principal investigator of the Genetics of Asthma in Latino Americans study. I love the acronym GALA, G A L A. And also, principal investigator for the study of African Americans' asthma genes and environments, better known as SAGE. So, did you start with the acronyms and work backwards? Yeah. Because My mother came up with the acronym. Yeah, they're, they're excellent <laughs> acronyms. His research focuses on the role of genetic and environmental risk factor, factors for asthma and drug response among racially and ethnically diverse populations. As I mentioned, he's also an attending physician in pulmonary and critical care medicine at the San Francisco General Hospital. His research focuses on identifying ethnic-specific genetic and biological risk factors for asthma, asthma severity, and drug responsiveness among U.S. ethnic and racial minority groups. He is interested in how race and racially specific genetic differences influence disease and response to therapies. He's also currently helping to develop methods to improve the application of population-based genetic studies to ethnic, ethnically admixing populations. Dr. Estaban Gonzalez Burchard received his MD from Stanford 
1995. He completed clinical training in internal medicine at Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital and in pulmonary critical care medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Gonzalez also completed his clinical research training at the Harvard School of Public Health and received a master's in public health degree in epidemiology from UC Berkeley. And he joined the UCSF faculty in 2001. It's a pleasure, sir, to have you on our campus to share your insight and your research with, with the URI community. Thank you so much for being here. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about less about health disparities, but so to speak, but really uh, want to exemplify the title of my talk, which is really to how to leverage the rich variation that exists within all populations to scientific advantage. Now, I'm going to talk about a lot of the research projects that we're doing and they focus on a couple of populations, <clears throat> particularly Hispanics and African Americans. But I want you to insert your own favorite population, whether it be Caucasian populations or European populations, because they're actually pretty diverse. Indian populations from India, they're very also, also very diverse. Asian populations are also genetically diverse. So don't, don't take it as a slight that I'm focusing on one or two populations. And I'm going to focus on those populations just for the interest of time. So the question is, why should we care? Well, the, the demographics of the United States are changing. Tolerance to interracial marriages, increased globalization are changing the way the world works. You can see it today when you go to any big city. Bay Area of California has the large, one of the largest populations of Indians from India. Amer India. We have the, one of the largest populations from Asia in California. And there's increasing intermating amongst these populations. So our prior notions about the idea of race and ethnicity are falling at the wayside, so to speak. <clears throat> and that presents challenges for us with respect to clinical research, biomedical research, clinical trials. We're increasingly farming out clinical trials to India, China, Russia, Brazil, and then taking those results and applying them to you. So one of the questions that you should be asking yourself is, can I take clinical results from India, a drug that's been developed in India, and does it work for me? So those are the sorts of questions we ask. And they're really not re related to health disparity, so to speak, but really, how do we understand the rich diversity that exists within us and how do we use it to scientific advantage and can we develop clinical methods that are applicable for all populations. So a big question that I've been challenged with and we collectively as a scientific community are challenged with is whether or not we should use race and ethnicity when we study disease and drug response. Now this is a huge debate and I know that you've had speakers last night that challenge whether or not this is a valid concept. And there are a lot of naysayers, and you had one last night that was here, um, because there are individuals that believe that race and ethnicity are purely social, that have nothing to do with biology, and that are just a system of categorization that was developed by Linnaeus hundreds of years ago to superiorize one group versus the other. And then there are folks that say, well, no, there are biologic factors that are associated with race. And this has become a huge fight. And I think it's partly due to the media likes to have a fight. Scientists don't necessarily communicate with each other. We talk to each other through the literature. So we're talking over each other's heads. We're not talking with each other. But regardless of what's going on in the scientific community, this is what's happening. The federal government is mandating that we look at race. And this is a black box warning, so most of you don't know it, but when you go to Walgreens or your Rite Aid and you get a medication, there's a, what's called a package insert. Does everyone know what a package insert is? That little square piece of paper? Has anyone bothered to open up that square piece of paper? It's like a map, right? If you read the fine print, this is the fine print, and I'm not going to have you read it, 
This is the fine print for a drug called carbamazepine. If any of you, if any of you are so unfortunate to have a seizure disorder, this is probably one of the first medications that was assigned to you or prescribed to you. But what's a little known secret, well known to the FDA, is that if you're Asian and you take this drug, you have a high risk of developing a disease called Stevens-Johnson syndrome in which all of your skin on the outside and on the inside, your intestines, sloughs off. You get exposed to gram-negative bacteria, you will die like that. So here's the package insert. Here are the key points that I want you to look at. Patients with ancestry and genetically at risk should be screened. At risk populations should be screened. Here's the other part. Patients of Chinese ancestry have a strong association with the genetic risk factor for Stevens-Johnson syndrome, that's SJS. Across Asia, there's notable genetic variation. And then finally, the genetic risk factor, which is HLA-B, is largely absent in individuals who are not Asian, meaning Caucasians, African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans. So, hey, I'm not home. <laughs> that, I'm sorry, I didn't know that was you. <laughs> I thought you were one of the students. I wanted to guilt trip you. Anyhow, so despite the academic debate of is race valid or not, the federal government is mandating that we look at it. So they, didn't, they don't care about this political correctness stuff. They recognize that there's something important with biology and race. So keep that in mind. So what we believe in at UCSF is that it's actually a complex construct. We recognize that some of the strongest determinants of health disparities are socioeconomic status and education, access to clean water. Those have nothing to do with biology. Maybe the water does, but really those are the social aspects of what we call race. And then there's biologic factors. And I'll show you and I hope to convince you that there's an interplay of our genetic background with environmental backgrounds. And it, we would be naive, if not foolish, to only think that race and ethnicity are simply social constructs. So that's going to directly contradict what my colleagues said last night. And I, I wasn't here, but I know what she talks about. So when I was in training, and since I'm in pulmonary, I was impressed by this observation. In the United States, if you look at asthma prevalence, it's highest in Puerto Rican populations and lowest in Mexican populations. Every other racial group, ethnic group in the U.S., fall somewhere in between those two pillars. African Americans, Caucasians, Asians aren't listed because they're actually a very, very small proportion of the total U.S. population. But we know that from recent research that they are somewhere down here. And you might say, well, perhaps it's because Puerto Ricans complain. And that might be true from an epidemiologic point of view. Perhaps there's a reporting bias. But what was fascinating to me is here you have a Hispanic group, two Hispanic groups that are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And yet all Hispanics at one point were considered to be a homogenous group. But this is not so easy to swallow because you're right, there could be a reporting bias. But what is hard to swallow is this observation. When you look at death rates amongst children with asthma, highest in Puerto Rican populations, highest in Africans, lowest in Mexicans. Now, it's very clear that social factors probably play a role, environmental factors play a role, but since I was trained as a molecular biologist and as a geneticist, I asked the question, could there be biologic factors that may help to explain this distribution? To that end, when I was a young resident, I initiated a study with the help of my mentor, Jeff Trazen, called the Genetics of Asthma Latino Americans. We have a replicate study going on right now in which we're recruiting 4,000 kids from all over the United States. And the results that I'll talk about for the rest of the evening come from these two studies. Well, in our initial study, the Gala 1 study, what we did is we recruited parents, mom, dad, and asthmatic child. And that's going to become important for the latter half of my talk. For all of our children, we had them perform what's called spirometry, uh, in which we have a child breathe in and out of a machine. And what that allows us to do is measure how tight their airways are.
And the, the graphical output that we get here is called a flow volume loop. And the slope of this line here determines how tight an individual's airway is. And we call that force expiratory volume, or FEV1. But the point that I want you guys to remember is that this is a reproducible, quantifiable, and objective measure of how tight an individual's airway is, or are. Then what we did is we had all the children take the most commonly prescribed asthma medication in the world, which is albuterol. Then we repeated the spirometry. So what we now have is a pre-albuterol shown in white and a post-albuterol shown in green. And the difference between the pre and post is a quantifiable measure of drug response, how well an individual responds to a drug. What we found, our first publications, was, was this. This is pretty impressive. On the y-axis, shown here, we have drug response. So the higher the bar, the better your drug response. The lower the bar, the lower your drug response. We have children on, under 16 on the left, children greater than the age of 16 on the right. And no matter how we sliced or diced the data, the strongest predictor of drug response in our hands was Puerto Rican ethnicity or ethnic background. Puerto Ricans had a much lower drug response to albuterol than, say, Mexican children. And here's a public health and clinical travesty, because here you have a population that has the highest asthma prevalence in the United States, almost in the world, highest asthma morbidity, and highest asthma death rate, and yet when they go on to take an inhaler, they don't have the same bang for their buck. We subsequently went on to reproduce res these results. We also went on to demonstrate that African Americans do not respond as well to inhaled corticosteroids, which are first-line therapy for treatment of asthma. So one of the questions you have to ask, and this is what we asked back in the early 2000s, is what does it mean to be Hispanic or African American? Now we started slipping into population genetics, because really, if you think about population genetics, the merging of, of the current populations in the Americas, I'm talking North America, Central and South America, really formed around 500 years ago. 1492, Christopher Columbus set sail. Subsequent to his rediscovery of the New World came the importation of African slaves. And um, what happened now is you had the melding of three major racial groups, Africans from Africa, Native Americans who... Uh, were here but rediscovered by Columbus. Then we had European, we had the massive, the largest migration of Europeans, uh, actually largest migrations of peoples in the world were Europeans coming from Europe to the New World. But the resulting population, and you can include whatever you want to talk about here, is this mixed population of what we call admixed populations. And I'm referring to Hispanics and African Americans, but this is true for Europeans. It's true for, Na for Indians from India. It is also true for Asians. In, in this particular cartoon, I'm focusing on African Americans and, and uh, Hispanics in the U.S. And what I tried to show with each cartoon is the color proportions differ. So red being Native American, green being African, yellow being European. And even though this whole group might be considered a, a homogenous ethnic group, the genetic variability or the ancestral variability from one individual to another differs. Now, okay, this is nice to have a cartoon, but how do we use real data? So what we did is we followed the examples used by CSI. I'm sure all of you have watched CSI. Here you have a forensic pathologist finds blood in the wall. They take blood off the wall. They do genetic testing. And they tell the police officer, gee, there's a 60% likelihood that this individual's European, 40% likelihood that this individual's Asian. Well, how do they do that? They do that through genetics. So we took those same genetic markers and we applied them to our population. We just wanted to get our heads around the population that we were dealing with. And this is what we found. At least when we had Mexicans and compared them to Puerto Ricans, we were able to sum up their average ancestral proportions. Individuals that said they are 100% Mexican, their parents were 100% Mexican, and their grandparents were 100% Mexican, on average had about 40% European ancestry shown in yellow, 52% Native American ancestry shown in red, 
7% uh, African ancestry shown in green. Puerto Ricans had a much larger African proportion and European proportion. On the group average, they were genetically distinct. That might help to explain some of the differences that we saw with respect to asthma prevalence and severity. But when we looked at individual ancestry, this is what we found. In this situation, each bar represents an individual. And each color represents that individual's ancestral proportion. So going from individual number one here down to individual 92, we see that individual number one on the bottom is mostly Mexican. Individual 49 is, is mostly European. That's like Vicente Fox, the former president of Mexico. I'm like individual 61. That's why people call me the undercover brother. Individual 92 is half African and half uh, Native American with a smattering of European. But the point is, and one of the take-home points that I want you guys to talk about when you go home at the dinner table, is the reality is most of us don't know what the hell we are. And in fact, when you sample populations in Europe that think that they're purely from Scotland or purely from Europe, you're going to find that there's a significant proportion of African genes in that population. If you go to a town in Yorkshire, about 6% of the population has, Afri on average, population has 6% African ancestry. So even though there, we might claim that we're pure, most of us are not pure. If you look at Indians from India, there's a significant amount of European ancestry there. If you look at Africans from East Africa, tremendous amount of European ancestry. And a lot of this, you can see, when you visually look at individuals from West Africa versus East Africa, they physically look different. It's not good or bad. It is what it is. So how do we take this global ancestry and take it a step further? So if we highlighted this one individual, individual number 59, who's Puerto Rican, here's what his or her genes or chromosomes might look at look like. And this is a cartoon. Here, we, each of us inherits 23 chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad. And you might have large blocks, say in chromosome one, large blocks of Native American ancestry, large blocks of European ancestry, and large chunks of African ancestry. And so what my lab does is say, how do we leverage these blocks, or what we call locus-specific ancestry, how do we leverage that to identify new genetic risk factors? So to give you a good example, let me use African Americans. We know that in the United States, African Americans are about 80% African, 20% European. And so what I tried to show in this cartoon was an African American individual with 80-20 proportions. Sorry if anyone's colorblind and they can't see red-green. But basically what I have is 80% of this individual's chromosomes are green and 20% are yellow. What's also important for you all to know is that multiple sclerosis, a devastating neurologic disease, primarily occurs in northern Europeans and is absent in Africa. Does anyone know a famous... African-American individual with multiple sclerosis? Chester Pryor. Nope. Parkinson's. Anyone? Montel Williams? Talk show? Montel Williams? Well, we, UCSF, tried, postulated that perhaps it was a European gene coming through the African-American population that was causing multiple sclerosis. They tried to do a study... They tried to go out to the community and have failed miserably. They went through Hollywood. They connected to Montel Williams. Montel Williams got Steve Hauser, who's the head of neurology at UCSF, on the Montel Williams talk show. Host, uh, talk show. And Steve is a Harvard-trained physician, so he's wearing a little bow tie. And he said, if, you have, if you're African-American and have MS and your uh, DNA to UCSF, well, that didn't work. Then Montel had to get on the show and say, if you're a brother or sister and you got MS, send your DNA to UCSF. And that's where we created the largest population, the largest study population of African-Americans with multiple sclerosis. Essentially, what they did from there is they used these CSI-type markers, these genetic markers, to map the genome of all these African-American patients with MS.
And what they found was beautiful. What they found was on chromosome 1, a large European chunk was common to every single patient that had multiple sclerosis. And it basically harbored the genetic risk factor for MS that explained multiple sclerosis in African Americans. So here's a beautiful example of how we leverage the rich diversity that exists within populations, that exists within a single individual to scientific advantage. And believe me, this not only benefited the African American community that had MS, because whites develop MS, it benefited whites. It it benefited every single population that suffers from multiple sclerosis. Because what it does, it allows us to identify new pathogenetic targets or pathways or the genetic architecture of a disease that is common in many populations. And so this is a success of how we leverage the diversity to identify new risk factors. So going back to my own data, here's that Puerto Rican individual. We, we genetically tested this individual at a million markers, and we assigned ancestry at every single marker throughout this individual's genome, or at least a million markers. And we can see that if you look at chromosome, say, list 22 down here, the individual is half Native American here, half European. It goes from Native American to African ancestry, then back to Native American, Native American, European ancestry, and so forth. And what we were asking now is, do any of these ancestral blocks correlate with disease outcome or drug response? And what we found is that at least in the Mexican population, if you're more Native American at chromosome 7, band 31, that you are protected from the development of asthma. If you were more European, at least amongst Puerto Ricans at this particular region, you are also protected from the development of asthma. So when you look at drug response, at least amongst Mexicans, if you inherited two European chromosomal chunks at this region, you had a much higher drug response, denoted by bronchodilator responsive on the y-axis, versus if you only had one European ancestral block versus if you had none. And so again, what what this is beginning to do, beginning to help us hone in on if you go from 10,000 feet down to the neighborhood block, so to speak. And what we like to do is get to the actual street address, meaning where the true genetic risk factor is. But we're using ancestry. We're leveraging the rich ancestral blocks that exists within each of us, each of us is the mosaic, to really hone in on genetic targets. So, enough with that. I don't want to convey the message that I think it's all genetic, because it's clearly not. I believe, as I mentioned at the outset, that the strongest determinant of health outcomes is socioeconomic status, poverty, and education, at least in the United States and in the world is going to be access to clean water. So, talking about what I just showed you, the genetic variation that exists within populations, we ask questions like, well, does genetics interact with social factors? Okay, now, let me talk to you about a surprise. Most of y'all do not marry just for love. Most of you marry for good looks, religious concordance, uh, educational status, earning potential. I didn't do this in college, but I should have. (laughs) My wife came from a poor background. But perhaps, but many of us do this. And in different societies, people do different things. Some societies only marry within their caste system. Some societies marry on height. Some societies marry on family wealth. We know that exists, blue blood, and uh, I went to school with a lot of them. But one of the questions that we asked is, are people marrying based upon genetic ancestry? And since we recruited lots of parents, mom and dad, and we had ancestry on everybody, we could ask that question. Remember I told you that we recruited mom and dad and we recruited families from Puerto Rico, New York, the San Francisco Bay Area, Mexico City. And let me just show you what we found, at least in Puerto Ricans. This is a complex slide, so I'll walk you through it. This is uh, dad's ancestry on the y-axis, mom's ancestry on the x-axis. 
This is a population of Puerto Ricans from New York, population of Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico. And what we found, shown here in blue, is that husbands that had more European ancestry tended to marry wives that had more European ancestry, whereas husbands that had more African ancestry, shown in yellow, tended to marry wives that had more African ancestry. This is a nice finding, and we validated it in an independent and separate population. And so what, what this really means is that in addition to all those other social factors that I mentioned, good looks, earning potential, height, somehow when we're looking at our mate, we're looking at things that what are called anthropometrics or physical characteristics that correlate with genetic ancestry. This made a tremendous splash in the scientific community because the scientific community, the genetic community, was kind of la, 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 everybody's randomly mating for love. Well, the reality is most of us are not, and we proved it here, and this undermines all the genetic assumptions out there for genetic epidemiologists. So this is important, but on a bigger level, from a 20,000-foot view, here we have social factors that are clearly interacting with genetic factors. And so we cannot sit there and think that social factors operate in isolation or genetic factors operate in isolation. Here we have, on the most basic level, gene-environment interaction. So we went on to ask bigger questions. So this is a, a cartoon of the island of Puerto Rico. And what we did is we collaborated with investigators, uh, Dr. Juan Carlos Martinez Cruzado, who did a census-based sampling of the entire island. And what my lab did is we measured genetic ancestry throughout the entire island. And we then we asked, what is the distribution of ancestry throughout the island? And then, what were the factors that shaped the distribution of ancestry? And what we found is shown here. On the top, we have the distribution of African ancestry. We have the distribution of Native American ancestry. And we have the distribution of European ancestry. The darker the color, the higher the proportion of ancestry. So in the capital of San Juan, we see that there's the highest amount of African ancestry, and it radiates out as you move away from San Juan. But we see also increased African ancestry on the east side, because that's most proximal to Africa, and then all the slave ports came this way, or the slave ships came this way, we also see increasing African ancestry at ports of entry, from legalized slave ports to illegal slave ports. We see that the European ancestry is highest in the middle of the island, because that's where the wealthy plantation owners lived. They liked to live in the high altitude, where it was cooler climate. And we see, because they had a systematic program to exterminate Native Americans, that Native Americans tended to hide in the central valleys of Puerto Rico to get away from being killed. So then the question is, what were the factors that shaped the distribution of ancestry? And here's what we found. We found that the strongest explanatory variable of the distribution of contemporary ancestry throughout all of Puerto Rico were historical events and geographic events, meaning that proximity to former plantation that was involved in the sugar trade explained the distribution of ancestry. We know that slavery was abolished a couple hundred years ago, but basically what happened, if you can envision this in your mind, is that when an individual who was on a plantation was all of a sudden became, became a free uh, citizen, what they did is they just moved next door. So proximity to former slave ports and proximity to former plantations determine today's contemporary distribution of ancestry. And this is actually very important because this undermines a, a, uh, an idea that we can no longer do. We cannot do what's called safari research, in which we parachute into a country like the Amazon, grab samples, and leave. In order to fully understand all the factors that go into shaping the distribution of disease, we really need to understand the population that we're dealing with, whether it's here in Rhode Island, whether it's here in the United States, or in an ideal setting like an island population, we got to understand the historical, geographic, 
social factors that shape the distribution of ancestry. And if those genetic factors correlate with disease, we'll better be able to under, uh, understand and disentangle the complex factors that go into shape the distribution of disease. So that was a very nice study, and it's under review. But let me challenge you with another notion. It is very clear that in the U.S., the poorer you are, the higher your risk for developing asthma. So if you're poor, you're going to get asthma, okay? That's been shown for multiple populations, white, black, Asian, every single population except Puerto Ricans. And so since we had the data, we had been recruited in Puerto Rico, we can ask the question, are there complex interactions between socioeconomic status and ancestry and its interaction on asthma outcomes? Or does it in increase the risk for asthma? So here's what we did. We looked at individuals that had no asthma, what we call healthy controls, and we had uh, ancestry, and since Puerto Ricans are really 50-50 European African, I, I depicted here in this graph the distribution of African ancestry amongst high socioeconomic status versus low socioeconomic status. And what, what we saw is known. Social epidemiologists have been talking about this for years, that individuals that had low African ancestry or high European ancestry were much better or well off than individuals that came from poorer backgrounds. This was not a surprise. But what we found too, when we looked at people that had asthma, we saw that wealthy folks who had asthma had much higher African ancestry than poor folks who had asthma. So what this is suggesting is that an individual's ancestry, and you could take it a step further, their racial characteristics or things that correlate with ancestry are operating differently in different socioeconomic environments. So perhaps there's psychosocial stresses that correlate with being more dark looking or having more African features if you live in a high SES environment versus a low SES environment. A good way to explain it is female CEOs. They're the first to break the glass ceiling. They're at the top of the food chain, but they're surrounded by men. Perhaps their experience is different than if they were surrounded by women CEOs. So this is a, this was the first example of a social economic ancestry interaction on increasing the risk for a complex but common disease. So what this really underscores is what I've been saying all along. We're going to need to take a very comprehensive approach, 30,000 foot view. We're need, going to need to have multidisciplinary research, social epidemiologists, genetic epidemiologists, biologists, physicians, community workers, field workers, people that understand anthropometrics, people that understand race, people that understand how discrimination gets in under our skin, so to speak. And again, keep in mind, even though I'm highlighting Puerto Ricans, we've seen this happen in every immigrant community, whether you're talking about Irish that came, you look at the old history books that said Irish need not apply. There were uh, um, derogatory terms for Italians. Obviously, this happened in Jews and in, during, in World War II. And it happens all the time in different countries. But this is the population that we're focusing on. Thank you. So, all right, so that was very nice and kind of esoteric and scientific out there stuff. So the real question is, can we make it applicable to clinical disease? Can we use this sort of information to improve clinical diagnosis and treatment? And so now what I'm going to talk about is a paper that we published this summer in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it got a lot of press internationally. It also got a lot of flack by social scientists. But the point is, we asked whether or not what we're doing, can we use it to improve clinical outcomes? Because that's at the bottom, at the end of the day, that is how I'm judged. And so remember I told you that we performed this test called spirometry. And 
Each of you, I know, has been to a pediatrician's office and the pediatrician's told your parent, gee, little Joey's at the 60th percentile for height. Well, believe it or not, little Joey is compared, if you're a white kid, you're compared to all other white kids, and that's how we come up with the percentile. If you're an Asian kid, you're compared to all other Asian kids. If you're an African-American kid, you're compared to all African-American boys, your age, your um, um, age category. So we're compared to what are called race-based standards. And that's exactly what we do for measuring lung disease. And these are the race-based standards in the United States. In 2005, it was recommended that all all physicians who measure lung function, or what we call spirometry, compare them to this particular curve. On the y-axis, which you cannot see on the the left side, we see uh, FEV1, which is severity of disease. And then on the x-axis, we have increase in age. But what you'll see is that there are three different curves, one for African Americans, one for Mexicans, one for Caucasians. Every time someone performs a lung function test, they're compared to one of these curves. And unfortunately, you don't get the opportunity to say what you think you are. It usually comes down to a technician who is not really medically trained in in determining race that looks at you, thumbs you up, and says, hmm, this guy looks like a black guy. This guy looks like a white guy. This guy looks like a Puerto Rican, but we'll give him the Mexican curve. So that's how all clinical medicine is done, at least with respect to lung disease. Now, this is complex and probably inaccurate. And the question is, where would this guy fit? Let me take a poll. Is he white or is he black? Why? He's just as much white. Mom is white. 50-50, 50-50, right? He said he is. Actually, he said he's not. He very, he, he very much went out on a limb saying he's not a black president. He's the president. But if you were a health care provider and you had to compare him to a reference standard, which would you use? Why? Why? Uh, but as a, as a health care provider, he's lying. He's lying, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, not, not a U.S. citizen. Are you part of the Tea Party? <laughs> the point is, either way, we're going to have some inaccuracies or what we call misclassification. If we compare them to a white reference curve or the black reference curve. Either way, it's good, we're going to be wrong. So... We know that African Americans are racially mixed, and this is a sample from our own data in which we measure genetic ancestry amongst African Americans from the east, from from the Bay Area, Oakland, who self-identified themselves, their parents, and grandparents as being 100% African American. And despite their what they thought, you could see that the amount of African ancestry shown in green varies, and the amount of European ancestry shown in yellow varies as well. On individual number one, which you can't see, which is the far left bar, that's Barack, 50-50. And then you have individuals way to the right that are mostly African. So the point is that there's a distribution. And the question that we have is, does that make a difference in determining lung function? So what we did is we got access to a national database of 777 African Americans, all of whom underwent that lung function test called spirometry, and we measured each individual for ancestry using a million genetic markers. So we had a pretty good and accurate estimate of true genetic ancestry. And this is the distribution of ancestry in that particular population, which is called cardia. We see that af- there's a huge curve that on average African Americans are consistent with what I previously told you, 80-20, 80% African, 20% European. But then there's a huge tail. So like Obama's way down here, 50-50. Then you have people like Denzel that are probably 95% plus, and Halle Berry is probably way down there, uh, even though she's also considered African-American. She's mostly white. So I hope this is under, undermining your idea of this concept of self-identified race. So the question is, can we improve upon clinical diagnosis? So, again, we ask, does it improve upon this measurement here? And so we have white reference equations, 
So if we took an average male who was 25 uh, years of age at 177 centimeters of height, this would be their expected lung function. If we took an average African-American male, 25, at 177 centimeters of height, this would be their expected lung function. But what we found when we included a model, a, a spirometry or a pulmonary reference equation that included genetic ancestry, we saw this, that with increasing amounts of African ancestry, that lung function decreased. So when we compare that to standard reference equations, if which is the African-American curve here is this horizontal line, if he had more African ancestry, the standard recommended curve would overestimate your lung function versus if you had less than the average African-American ancestry, the standard reference curve would overestimate your lung function in the negative direction. So it would overclassify you as having disease when you truly did not have disease. So that's a hard concept to explain, and I don't want to get into this, but for every 1% increase in African ancestry, we saw an 8 uh, millimeter or 8 cc reduction in lung volume. So if for, for someone like Barack to Denzel, multiply that by 50. That's a pretty big number, 450 cc's of lung volume. That's a half a liter. Our lungs only have about four liters. So you're talking about a sizable proportion of misclassification of disease. We went on to replicate this in independent populations, and that's why we got into the New England Journal. And here's the distribution of air. When you compare the traditional model to our model, that there's some individuals that were underdiagnosed and some individuals that were overdiagnosed, and this is males. And again, this is the distribution of air for females. And to put it in plain English, here's a good example, a poignant example. Here you have an average individual, 25 years old, 177 centimeters of height. One individual is 50% African, one individual is 95%. Using the standard reference of equations, we would get uh, different predictions of the volume of lung, um, lung capacity, 4.2 liters versus 3.8. That's a 10% difference. Well, that's a pretty big error when you're talking about making clinical diagnoses. And the reason is that we use these clinical diagnoses as arbitrary but fixed cutoffs. So if you're at the 71 percentile, we don't consider you to have disease. But if you're at the 69th percentile, we consider you as having disease. And so it's very important when we're near what we call these clinically accepted standard cutoffs. When you're near those cutoffs, a 10% error rate could actually lead to a misdiagnosis. It could lead to inappropriate referrals for inappropriate workups of disease. It could lead to inappropriate tests, like increased CT scans. So if you were a CEO of a hospital, this would be a problem because it would be on your dime. And if you're a patient, you would be exposed to unnecessary increased radiation. And as you know, with any test, there's a high likelihood of finding false positives. So if we submitted someone who erroneously had a diagnosis and they went for a CT scan and they saw something and they went on to have a needle put in their lung to biopsy, then they had a complication where we popped their lung, it becomes a whole new can of worms simply because of this 10% error rate. Well, we also use this information to diagnose disability we also use it to determine who goes on to develop or get access to lung transplants. And we also use it to determine who is an acceptable risk to go to surgery. Now, let me put this in a real-life perspective, because I gave this talk in Oakland, California, to, as a fundraiser. And the chief of the Oakland Fire Department was in the audience. And after my talk, she came up to me and said, you know, this is very important for my men. Because when, I, when you're a firefighter and you go into a burning building, you incur what's called smoke inhalation. Smoke inhalation damages the lungs. And so now you got a problem. You have a good citizen who is doing his or her job, and they incurred an occupational injury. And then you got a third-party payer, the insurance or disability. And they're at odds with each other because the insurance company does not want to pay. But you, as the firefighter, if you truly have disease, 
you want to get paid what was coming to you. So what they do is they send that firefighter to me as a pulmonary specialist. We have them perform the spirometry. We send the results back to the firefighter and to the insurance company. And because there are fixed clinical standards that if you're 71% of normal, you're healthy, you can go back to work and we don't have to pay you if I'm talking for the insurance company. But if you're the firefighter, if you're 71%, you don't get the disability. But I told you there's about a 10% error rate. So if there's even a 10% error rate of 70% and it brings you down to 63%, that means you qualify for benefits. So it makes a huge difference. And so that's the sort of information that I'm talking about. And this is not only relevant for African Americans, it's relevant for many racially mixed populations where we can improve upon current clinical diagnoses by really taking the bull by the horns, grabbing this complex, controversial issue of race, ethnicity, and ancestry, and using it to improve clinical outcomes. So to sum it up, here's what I believe. I don't want to give you the impression that it's all genetics. It's not. I clearly believe that genes are interacting with environmental factors. The strongest environmental factors that we have to date are social factors, demographic factors. We know that migration status, social class, all determine the environments that we live in. They interact with genetics. Together, they result in gene-environment interactions. And working where I work at San Francisco General, where I treat poor patients, we know that access to care is a big determinant of who has disease and who has severe disease. So really, again, to echo what I've always said is that we're going to need to take a really multidisciplinary and complex approach. So let me sum it up because this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to identify population-specific risk factors for disease as well as improving prediction of drug response. And our ultimate goal is to do this by studying multiple populations, whether they be African American, Hispanic, Caucasians, you name it, we're, we're reaching out to make sure that we have broad representation within our clinical research. So I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of people, so I want to just acknowledge the folks in my lab uh, that I um, have worked with that have actually done the work that I talked about today, and I want to acknowledge the funding sources that I've had. And I'm going to end it there, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come here. It's been a beautiful opportunity. Thank you. Melvin, for inviting me. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure. One of the, uh, being another molecular biologist. Okay. Um, one of the questions is, should, if the, the cost of sequencing an individual's genome drops down below $500, like we're talking about, should every human in the U.S. be sequenced? So the question is, um, if sequencing in an individual's entire genome is going to drop to less than 500 bucks, should we do it? Um, pretty soon, we're going to get to a stage where we're genetically testing everybody through these gene chips. And regardless of what your race is or what you think you are, we're going to be able to say, these are your risk factors. These are drugs that are going to work for you and not work for you. Sequencing takes it, you know, like a several log fold higher. Um, the problem that we are facing right now is that genetic risk factors are not linear or they're not absolute. Craig Venner, you know, had the mutation for Alzheimer's disease, the ApoE4 gene, and they asked him what he thought. He said, I don't care. And it's true. Because just because you carry the genetic risk factors does not mean that you're going to go on to develop disease. What we need to do is we need to have more research in this area. And what's also important, what's fascinating about the Alzheimer's mutation, the ApoE gene, is that it has the lowest frequency in Asians, but the highest risk. It has the highest frequency in African Americans, but the lowest risk. And so when you go to these direct-to-consumer marketing companies and you get your genetics done and, and you look to see if you got the prostate cancer gene, before it tells you the results, you have to do a pull-down. There's a menu pull-down, and you have to say if you're black or you're white. And when you look at the risk, it flips if you're black or white. So we don't have a very good understanding of how 
whatever corresponds to this idea of race. You know, is it ancestry? Is it the food that we that whites or blacks eat that modify? We don't have we don't know enough, but it's an important area of study. And we have a lot of naysayers that are saying, you know, we shouldn't do that. But you know, as I I said in public before, if I were God, I'd prioritize some things first. You know. Reducing poverty, improving water, improving the education. Genetics would be somewhere in the middle. Going and bombing the wrong country on the wrong data would be way at the bottom. But it has to be within our, in our uh, armamentarium of what we do. And there is research that may seem arbitrary and naive. Look at how penicillin was developed, Look, taking the urine out of soldiers. You know, all that work led to tremendous improvements in mortality. And I think it's going to be important that we continue to focus on this. Sure. Um, I had a question about the interaction between genes and environment. Yes. Um, so there's evidence that there's allele-specific variations in chromatin structure that are heritable. And I was wondering if there's... Terrible? Heritable. Heritable, yes. I was wondering if there's any evidence that there's a correlation between chromatin structure and genetic ancestry. And if so, how does that relate to your model? We're... So the question was, are cr- things that modify chromatin structure heritable? And she said they are. Um, and the question was, are, are there heritable modifiers of ancestry? We're working on that. We're, we and uh, Carlos Bustamante at Stanford are working on whether an ancestry modifies gene expression. We know that ancestry does modify gene expression in immortalized cell lines. We know that. But those are immortalized. Those are perturbed with the virus that causes the leukemia virus. So what we're asking is, does the fact that you have a European block in your genome, does that influence gene expression? From in vitro or cell-based assays, immortalized cell lines, we know that African Americans versus Caucasians have different gene expression patterns. We also know, which is really cool, is, is if you take cells from an African-American patient, cells from a white patient, in a test tube now, right? There's no discrimination, there's no social factors, and you add gamma interferon, which is used to treat hepatitis, you get a tremendous response out of whites, you get low response out of blacks, and we know that African-Americans don't respond well to interferon therapy for hepatitis C. So we're seeing racial differences within the test tube. So we need to take it a step further, and we are doing that. People are beginning to sequence the entire genome and look at gene expression. Going to your other question, whether environmental factors that, say, modulate chromatin or methylate chromatin, whether or not they're heritable, that's been proven. We know that in utero events that happen to, the, say, the mother smoking or she's exposed to something, it passed on to the child, and it's passed on to that child's child. We know that that's true. So there's clear what we call epigenetic factors, and one of the persons that lead, is leading that work is David Schwartz out of out of Denver, at least for for asthma in, in humans and, and in mouse models. Any other? You had a question. What's the role, or is there a role of uh, the cellular sort of dimension to all of this um, in terms of adaptation and the, the cells and cell biology have any? Yeah. So the question, he wants me to repeat the questions, is are there cellular mechanisms that play a role in this? Sickle cell is the best example. Sickle cell is a common genetic mutation. We've known about it for years, 50 years. It's due to a single base pair change that results in the sickling of the hemoglobin. And the only reason that we... We collectively, probably 99% of all scientists, collectively believe that it's still around is because it protects you from malaria. They recently identified a new genetic risk factor that's African-specific that causes premature kidney disease and hypertension. And the, the, re, the cellular consequences, the protein consequences of a mutated gene are that it also protects you from malaria. And that may help to explain why there's a increased prevalence of hypertension, say, in African-Americans. They, African-American black men go on and develop hypertension about 15 years earlier than white men. 
And there could be biologic explanations for that. And there's a paper just published in Nature looking at, at genes related to the myosin heavy chain gene that protect, uh, develop against the development of malaria. So it's, it's, it's clear that if you lived in Africa and had that mutation, it would confer survival advantage. But when you take individuals out of that particular environment and bring them to a new environment, it has deleterious advantage or disadvantages. I don't think every gene is going to be like that, um, but those are some of the poster child examples that we like to point out, where it's clearly that there are gene environment interactions. Same thing with uh, lactose intolerance, that was, which is primarily in Europeans, and that was thought to protect against dysentery. Yes? In this new era... I can't believe you have a question because you've heard this three times now today. I know, I know. <laughs> In this new era of personalized medicine and uh, uh, genomics, how is that going to change uh, uh, curriculum for... Oh. Pharmacy, yeah. for the College of Nursing, for uh, the college, Colleges of Medicine. How, how is that going to happen? Okay. So the question was, how does this new information, this new genomic era change or going to change our education? Well, I'm, I, I got hired by the School of Pharmacy. to make sh- I teach 122 PharmD students all about pharmacogenetics. We want to make sure that our PharmD students are trained to go out to the workforce and understand that if you give a kid that has uh, sensitivity to uh, some of the cancer drugs, that genetic factors play a role in determining dose. We are also revamping medical education, and the leader right now is Johns Hopkins Medical School. They have turned their medical school upside down, and as you can imagine, because Teaching is tied to dollars, which is tied to departments, and I know you know this well, that it's, it was a slog. It was a slog, but they collectively decided to revamp medical education from first years all the way up to medical residents, surgical residents, and that meant rele- releasing time that was given to a department, releasing dollars. So this is a wave that's happening. And I, I think that it's going to be incumbent upon us to, to retool not only students, but we, we need to retrain the educators as well. And that's going to happen in nursing. It's going to happen in pharmacy schools, in schools of medicine, in schools of dentistry as well. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about how you partnered with some kind of more, um, like you, you discussed problems like clean water. Like how do we address a really basic um, disease on the unfairness that exists in the world? Like you're born in a place that has not yeah. been How do, from your high tech position, how, how should we address these? So the question was um, if we're talking about health disparities or social inequities that result in differences in health outcomes, what has genetics got to do with it? um, Not much. And as I told you earlier, if I were God, I'd prioritize differently. You know, education and reducing poverty. Actually, one of Martin Luther King's big charges before he was murdered was um, his war against poverty, recognizing that poverty afflicts not only African uh, black folks at the time, but people from Appalachia. And so, yeah, that's a common factor that I think we're going to need to address. And that's complex because we live in a capitalistic society. But collectively throughout the world, folks are working on this. Um, Clean water, obviously, is a a major factor. I just read a report by the World Health Organization. If you look at the top ten diseases stratified by wealthy countries versus middle-income countries versus low-income countries, the top three diseases are um, hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol. And so India is marketing a triple pill in which they have a generic uh, statin, which is a drug to reduce cholesterol, a generic antihypertensive, which is 
of drug to reduce your blood pressure and an aspirin. And that single pill combination alone will reduce a significant amount of mortality throughout the world. Now, you know, we tend to think that HIV is the dominant disease, but when you look at the grand spectrum of things, it is actually a very small percentage of all deaths. Hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and high cholesterol are the number one killers, whether you're rich or, or poor. And then, you know, we need a global assault on, on tobacco. We've done a great job in California reducing tobacco, but all we've really done is moved it out of our borders. You, nine out of ten Chinese men in China smoke. Nine out of ten. It is astronomical. Some people have conspiracy theories suggesting that that's part of the government because tobacco is funded by the Chinese government. It's a, it's a revenue source. It makes people work harder because they're constantly smoking, working. It's a conspiracy theory, but there's a lot of work that's gone into it. And then at, when, they're, when individuals are no longer useful, meaning that they've, over, they've, they've gone over the utility hump, they die. <laughs> we need a global assault on, on tobacco. That that true. That is true. But like a, genetics, biomedical research, animal model research, you know, talking about rodent research, mouse research, those are all important, but they're not at the top of our list. But again, they're not at the bottom of our list. The war <laughs> on wrong data cost a lot of money. It devastated the NIH budget. And I'm a standing member. Uh, I've withstood the last eight years of tremendous NIH cuts because of a bad decision. We've lost a whole generation of NIH-funded scientists because someone went to war on a bad decision that cost a lot of money, not to mention a lot of lives. Sorry to get political, but it's, um, it's, it's devastated the NIH, and we're still paying for the consequences. You had a question. Is the population that genetics that is the population that you don't really have a certain, like say, um, genetic ancestry, a certain percentage, that qualifies into the race? I'm, I'm sorry, can you speak up? Um, see, the population is mixing, and that eventually everyone's not qualified as a genetic population or a certain race based on their ancestry. How do then attack that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, um, speak up. You could do it. <laughs> yell, yell it out louder. Maybe I just can't hear it. Come closer, man. Come closer. Racial purity. She's trying to get back to her. So are you saying that genetic ancestry, that has correlation to certain diseases based on genetics and where people came from, right? Some diseases, not all. So if our populations are mixing so that it's interracial uh, relationships and crosses, how would you then address that in your research? Well, we, uh, I, I think the question was if, if our initial premise was that there are some diseases that have a racial basis, meaning that they might have originated in one population, say Africans, and not in another population, say Europeans. But now you have all this interracial mixing. What does that do to disease disparities? And then if that's the case, how do we address it? Is that what you mean? No? Do you think, so like the, the two differences, just say disease A is hot, or a disease is high in population A and low in population B, but if the two populations are mixing, should it come to some equilibrium? It seems like the way you're approaching it, that you're concentrating on populations based on their ethnicity, and you're not really looking at the racial basis of the population. Oh, okay. Yes, now I understand. So right now, up to, up to now, all we're doing is correlations with ancestry. And you're right, it's not good enough. 
Because what we we don't actually care if it has to do with what proportion of African or European ancestry we have. It's a step further, but the next step what we want to do is actually find the genetic mutation that is causative. And that was a critique of our New England Journal paper. We correlated that ancestry improved measures of lung function, but we didn't actually find the gene that controlled lung function. That's the next step. But what we're doing is because of the, for statistical methods, looking at a million markers in the genome, if we did a million tests, we would have to pay a high statistical penalty, what's called a Bonferroni correction, for doing a million tests. But because we're only looking at ancestral blocks, of which there are about 500, we only get penalized for 500 tests. And what that does, it allows us to look at, say, a given ancestral block And now we can exclude all the other ancestral blocks and just focus in on what are the genetic mutations that are riding, physically riding on that block. Does that make sense? But what are you basing your populations on? Is it based on phenotypes? What am I basing the populations on? How do we assign, say, Asian versus African? Well, other... I rely on population geneticists who have sampled the, the entire populations from around the world. National Geographic is doing a thing called Big Blue, in which they're doing comprehensive sampling of DNA from all around the world. And we use those as references, and what we call ancestral reference populations. Your tax dollars paid for a thing called HapMap. They're also paying for a thing called the Thousand Genomes, in which we're sequencing thousands of individuals from India, different groups in China, different groups in Latin America, Europe. And we're trying to better catalog the variation that exists within continents and, and around the world. And we're, we use that as a reference to be able to say that this particular genetic mutation more likely arose, say, in Northern Asia versus Southern Asia, Northern Europe versus Southern Europe. Pretty soon, these Racial category, categories on the genetic basis are all going to be moot. That's where we're headed. We're not there yet. And part of that it was due to politics. It started in the uh, 80s and 90s that when we as the U.S. government created what's called the HAP map, we included only specific populations. We included Han Chinese. We included Japanese. We included uh, Europeans from Utah called the Seths. We included Nigerians from Africa. And those four groups became our reference source. And we did a tremendous disservice because we did not include Native Americans, and that was a political issue. Native Americans did not want to be included. And so all this genetic research went on in the absence of Native Americans. So all the new benefits that derived from the Genome Project did not apply to Native American groups. We had HapMap 2, we now have HapMap 3, it's going to be HapMap 4, where we're now recognizing, gee, we need to do a better job of sampling. And that's what they're doing. So I'm, as I'm speaking, I'm talking October 6, 2010. In a month, in a year, these reference equations for po- population references are all going to change. It's a dynamic but iterative process. Does that get at your point? Okay. Visualize for us what it's what personalized medicine will look like in 10, 15 years. Where I think we're going, uh, and it may be longer than 10 or 15 years, but I, I I think for drugs, it's very close. That we'll be able to do a genetic test, and we're already doing this for blood thinners. Um, blood thinners, uh, which we use all the time what's called warfarin or coumadin, people that have irregular heart rhythms, they're on blood thinners. People that have blood clots in their legs, they get on blood thinners. The problem with blood thinners is that you need to get a patient therapeutic before they can leave the hospital. And that takes four or five days. And 
strong predictors of, of how long it takes to get to a therapeutic dose are your race and your genetic background at two or three genes. And so what's happening is now, and there are clinical trials going on in which we're measuring your genetics at these three genes in addition to your race, and then we're coming up with the best guest on a starting dose for medications, for Coumadin in this case. And so we're already beginning to see it happen. We're doing this for some of the anti-cancer drugs um, in, in that we're testing you before we start the drug to determine your dose. Mandated in Taiwan. If you're, if you're in Taiwan and you have a seizure disorder and you're about to be started on carbamazepine, you get genetically tested. It's mandated in certain countries like Singapore, other countries where there's a high frequency of that genetic mutation. So the pharmacogenetic part is coming faster than the disease part. And the disease part's going to take a long time simply because I said that diseases are not linear, meaning that if you have the breast cancer gene, doesn't mean you're going to develop breast cancer. There are a lot of other factors that go into it. We're trying to develop models that allow us to better predict, but also what we call risk stratification. That's happening too. That's happening right now. So God forbid that you develop lung cancer, but if you were to develop lung cancer, what they would do is they do a biopsy of the lung cancer itself. They look at gene expression patterns of your lung cancer, and then they'd say, gee, Mr. Wade, based upon this pattern, we think you can get away with just one or two drugs, but if you had this pattern, we think we should hit it hard with these drugs, what we call adjuvant therapy. And, and that's how we're using genetics already to risk stratify individuals. But it's a big leap of faith to go from, you have the breast cancer gene, you're going to get breast cancer, because that's not true. And that's why the FDA has put the kibosh on these direct-to-consumer marketing companies, because they were implicitly saying, come to our website, and then they wouldn't say anything, because they wouldn't give you any counseling, but you would go and say, oh, God damn, I got the breast cancer gene. And then you'd go Google breast cancer, people with BRCA2 mutation, and you find a social support group that may not, may or may not be medically trained and, and giving you advice. And, and that's when the FDA said, okay, you guys as a company are crossing into the device mode where you're selling your tools, your, your snake oil, as medical gospel. And that crossed the line. And that's when they clamped, this is June, when they clamped down, and there's a company, I forgot its name, but they marked, they, they paired up with Walgreens to offer genetic testing off the shelf. And it came out one day and closed the next, FDA. Yeah, so I didn't talk about it, but we proved that uh, there are genetic polymorphisms at the beta-2 receptor that partially explain that observation, and that the distribution of the good poly, the drug-responsive polymorphism to the not-drug-responsive polymorphism differed between the Mexican and Puerto Rican populations. But it's not just that. There are other genes that are involved. And I didn't want to get too much into the the details of the genetics of it. I wanted to keep it high level, but yeah, we, we, we and lots of others have worked on that. All right, well, thank you. I know it's a late night. Thank you very much for staying. <laughs>